The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. When I started this podcast 11 years ago, there were just a handful of people who were producing regular educational content on photography. Now, between podcasting and YouTube, you have hundreds of people doing unboxing videos, camera reviews, or Photoshop tutorials. And as the recent demise of popular photography magazine proves, the internet is the resource most people turn to to learn more about photography. And while I've checked out many of these other podcasts and YouTube videos, I tend to gravitate to those people who I feel express a sincerity and an honesty about sharing their love for photography. I don't want to spend time watching or hearing content from someone who I wouldn't want to be spending time with in the real world. I feel that way about Jamie McDonald, who along with his partner Mike Benning are the hosts of the Mirrorless Minutes podcast. They are both Olympus trailblazers, and though their tech focus is obviously on Olympus equipment, they share their joy and passion for photography in a way that it doesn't make much of a difference what brand they're using. Most importantly, Jamie is a great photographer and a person who has created a great body of work even while maintaining a normal 9-to-5 job. Jamie is the kind of man that makes wonderful work and is really successful at making things happen. Well, Jamie, welcome to The Candid Frame. I'm, I'm really pleased to have a chance to, to talk with you. Very excited to be on. Yeah, I've, I've been checking out your show periodically over the last couple of years that you've been doing it. So, unfortunately, with all the content that's out there, I'm not a regular... I, I may produce a podcast, but that doesn't mean I get to consume a lot of stuff on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many other things to do. Right. I know we definitely hit a, a certain small niche audience, too, so... But you guys have a nice rapport on, on the show, which is, I'm sure that's appreciated by the people who are fans of the show. Yeah, Mike and I get along really well. Uh, I think it makes it a lot easier to do what we're doing just with that fact alone, you know, that we can talk like we do with one another. Yeah. Well, uh, before we start talking about the show, I wanted to talk about you and your, your photography. Sure. I, I read that, you know, you had been creative in high school, but that you sort of had put your creativity away until until later uh, when you picked up a camera again but back when you were in high school were you how were you creative was it with photography or was it with something else no it's funny you know photography didn't enter my life until quite a bit later in high school it was pretty much uh, pen and ink drawings and watercolors were the the mediums that I liked to work in I had this sort of an interest in photography from afar. I just liked the thought of photography, but just didn't have the financial means to own a camera at that time. So it was never something that I had, had pursued. Mm -hmm. And why do you think you stopped? Uh, stopped creating. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you know, I was going through some of your, uh, other interviews from the past. I'm just kind of catching up on some stuff and listening to Art Wolf talk. And it was funny. He mentioned people growing up in different regions, maybe having different influences. And he mentioned Michigan specifically and mentioned it uh, in light of people in that region may tend to find themselves following in their parents' footsteps. And he mentioned manufacturing specifically. And being that I'm from Michigan and from a region that's really manufacturing heavy, that's kind of what I ended up doing. I went straight from high school and right into working and ended up in the manufacturing field. So I pretty much went from high school to quote unquote responsible adulthood and a job, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What kind of what kind of industry was your your father and your parents involved in? Uh, so my father worked in manufacturing for a company that made products for aerospace industry, and my mother was a stay at home mom. And I ended up in a manufacturing facility that, of course, worked in automotive. You know, here in Michigan, so that was kind of where I ended up for quite a while. Yeah, was just doing the uh, the job and meeting my wife, and then starting a family. 
was it a situation where a lot of your your friends had were kind of kind of following following suit that you didn't have you know other sort of creative people involved that, that do you think that sort of influenced your sort of yeah. pulling away from being creative definitely that's definitely a big part of it you know when i left high school about half of the people that i spent time with in high school left for college those who again you know had financial means to go to college took off for college those who didn't kind of found themselves in the same situation i was in you know in the workplace and working you know it's 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 a it's a familiar story it's not just about the fact that you're sort of in in in, in adulthood right. where all of a sudden you sort of put aside that creativity but I think it's, it seems like you can't give yourself permission that you're not taking your life seriously if you're indulging in this sort of creativity, if you're not going out there and trying to, you know, make a living and right. earning money. And then all this other stuff seems like a luxury that, that when you're starting your life, you can't afford. And it isn't, you, and it doesn't get reintroduced to many people's lives until they have children or, <laughs> or they retire. And yeah. that's a common mo motif, but. I think whatever way you get back into it is is a good thing. Yeah, I chuckle because you met, the first thing you mentioned about people who kind of find themselves getting back into uh, into being a creative. You mentioned children, and that was the impetus for me getting a camera. You know, was yeah. firstborn child, family vacations, and things of that nature. So that resonates. So, how did you find photography at that point? I mean, because it wasn't what you had done in, in high school. So, right, it's so weird. You know that I would have even found myself where I'm at today, looking back at, you know, the the driving force behind getting a camera was our first family vacation with my son, the first trip where we would be taking a plane somewhere. And I decided, you know, that the only way to document this vacation was going to be with, you know, a quote unquote pro camera with the lenses that change in and out. I didn't even know any of the terminology at that point. I just knew that it was good if you could swap lenses in and out. So that's okay. kind of what led to it. And how did you sort of expand from merely, not merely, but, but documenting your family life and your, your travels into doing other things with photography, like the, the landscapes and the portraits and all the other things you've, that you've come to do with the camera? You know, I think that I, I almost feel like if someone picks up a camera and shoots with it more than, you know, on occasion, I think at some point you're going to be driven to create with it and not just shoot with it. Um, I just felt like it was a natural progression to go from doing snapshots of my son as he's running around on the beach in Florida to lying on the beach and photographing seashells, you know, and the waves breaking and the palm trees and things like that. I don't I don't know that there's any way to not get to that point in your photography. It's it's I, that's just how I look at it, anyways. Yeah. Did you have a particular moment um, in which you really felt like I, I got to stop playing around? I got to really take this seriously. Maybe not not necessarily that you wanted to make a living from it, but that you wanted to invest a good part of your time to making pictures. You know, I don't know if there was an aha moment, but there was definitely a turning point. And that was when I attended my first Scott Kelby photo walk. Mm -hmm. Just being around so many people who were so excited to shoot, you know, I just had a friend here or there, you know, who shot up until that point. And then attending that Kelby walk and meeting so many people, you know, I realized that, you know, this is, I'm a social person. So for yeah. me, photography, a lot of it is social as well. So I realized that there was definitely a big group of people out there that I could relate to. And then getting involved with those people after the group, I just started to shoot more and more. And it just became more important to me to just do better work. I don't know. It's, it's a really hard thing for me to answer, I guess. Uh, I don't really have a specific turning point, I guess. Yeah, but that, that makes sense, you know, having the beginnings of a community. I know that for me, I always struggled, like, finding a community because, I, you know, when I came up, there was no Internet. There was no message boards. There was nothing like that. And I, I made several attempts to get, you know, photographers together on a regular basis. But we photographers can be a flaky bunch. Right. And, and it was, you know, soon it became very difficult to sort of hold it to, together. So I can see the advantages of the, the social networks and, you know, and being online and being able to connect with people. You know, I know that big part of what you've been able to build for yourself has been you being able to leverage the the internet and social networking. When when did that start becoming a, a part of what you were doing? 
Oh, from day one. So I'm one of those geeky people who, as soon as they see something new online that they can become, you know, part of the beta program for, I sign up for it. Okay. So, you know, the early days of Twitter, I was involved with it as soon as possible. And it just seemed to make sense to share my photography on Twitter. So right from day one of getting the camera, I just started sharing my photos and then just mentioning what I shot it with. You know, I'd say that I shot it with my Olympus OMD E3 or my Olympus E3 and 50 to 200, you know, so I just immediately started sharing socially and um, mentioning the equipment that I was using. And I think by doing that that early in the game, it just kind of helped me to connect with manufacturers out there. Uh, Mm -hmm. Think Tank Photo being another one of those. I had a really good working relationship with their social media people right up front as well by mentioning that I was, you know, carrying their bag or whatever. So I think social media definitely steered where my photography went as well as, you know, the creative side of things. You know, one of the, I think one of the challenges about using social media effectively is kind of understanding that they each work differently and then they're not all equal. Right. I mean, Facebook has a different dynamic than Twitter than does Instagram. Right. For people who, you know, they may be signed up for all these services. Can you tell us a little bit about how you use each of those differently? Sure. Um, so for me, Twitter is just initially, you know, Twister, Twitter started out as just a status update, you know, because it's short form. You've got a very limited set of characters to work with. Um, it was basically just, you know, Jamie's out shooting, you know, or quick share of a photo, you know, that, you know, I shot this with so and so piece of equipment. And then Facebook is something completely different because you can, there are no restrictions on uh, character count. So you can tell a story on Facebook. Facebook reaches a completely different audience as well. I mean, everybody from, you know, younger people, I'm in my early 40s, all the way up to, you know, my parents and, you know, grandparents are on Facebook. So it's easier to tell like a more involved story or make it a little more personal on Facebook. And then Instagram for me, Instagram is the challenge right now. Trying to grow an Instagram account is the craziest thing. I honestly haven't wrapped my head around it yet, but I I like to use Instagram just as a way to show where I'm at or what I'm doing. So while I might share a photo on Twitter and talk about a shot, you know, and talk about the specifics of equipment on Instagram, I lately I do a lot of either shots of where I'm at shooting or self portraits of me in the location shooting Mm -hmm. a little bit of narcissism, I suppose. (laughs) You know, one of the things that I've admired with some people who use it is the relationships that they're able to build. And sometimes it's just something that's completely lost to me. Yeah. Um, You know, because I see some people and they talk about, they build these relationships with people online and then they attend like, um, like a Photoshop world or WPPI or some, some event. And all of a sudden they're like connecting with people that they've known online for a very long time. And, and for me, it's like I've always kind of just wondered, like, how do you build and maintain a genuine relationship online? I know that, you know, the, the commonality of photography is one thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it leads into an engagement. Right. Cause I don't want to, I, cause I, I don't, I know some people kind of use it as a marketing device, which I'm not interested in doing, you know? Yep. I know I, I should be to some extent, but you know, I, I, I'm more interested in sort of engaging on a, on a, on a personal level with people when I do I really enjoy it. But get to talk to us about, you know, being able to use, use that to build relationships in sort of a genuine way where, you know, everybody who's involved is, is, you know, being served in, in a good way. Right. You know, I think that's where um, Facebook as a platform works the best, you know, especially for me, that's how I'm using it. You know, I interact with people on Facebook. Originally, Facebook, I'll just say started off as just a personal account. It was my separation from all my public social media stuff, you know, with Olympus and Think Tank Photo and other brands. I used Twitter for those. And then it was Facebook was just friends and family, old high school friends and whatnot. And slowly it evolved into, you know, I'd meet somebody at at a camera shop, you know, or a photo walk. And I started adding those people. And finally, I just realized I needed to, for me, I needed to open it up and just everybody that's in my photography life, you know, that's where we all kind of hang out. And so I've just kind of made Facebook the place where that happens. It's just a natural thing maybe for me to be social and just interact with people. I've got friends that I've met at the Out of Chicago conference over the last couple of years that I talk to almost on a daily basis. And 
again, you know, I mean, you you know, the commonality there, of course, is photography. But I think that once you start communicating with people, you know, more than just once a month or once every couple of months or once every trade show, you know, you, you find a something of interest with everybody that you can communicate with. And I think that, you know, if it wasn't for Facebook and uh, meeting people at these shows, I think my friend count might be a lot smaller yeah. <laughs> on Facebook than it is. It's really easy, you know, to just have an open dialogue and just chat back and forth on Facebook. That, so that's just kind of where I'm using it. Well, tell me about being a photographer uh, up where you are. You know, I'm, I'm a California boy, so, right. you know, I got access <laughs> to a lot of sort of diversity, the desert, the beaches, the mountains, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, tell me about what you think the advantages are about where you are in your part of the country with respect to the kind of photography that you love to do. Well, I think that the advantage is also what the disadvantage is, because I think my landscapes aren't quite as varied as they are out west. I don't have mountains here. I don't have deserts. I don't have wide open vistas, or at least not very wide open anyways, you know, a couple of acres, I suppose. Um, so it's 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 forced me to to reevaluate, you know, what I think works in a landscape scene. I need to be able to isolate subjects. You know, Michigan is part farmland and part city, and we've got beautiful coastlines along the Great Lakes. And that's it. There's there's no major striking features other than coastline here. So if you look at my photography, you'll find a lot of scenes that involve a lot of sky in my photos. I like to compose my landscapes with a lot of dramatic skies, or I'll focus on a particular object in a scene, like an old barn or a weathered old tree or something of that nature. So I know I follow a lot of people online and their landscape photos. For the people that live out west, they just seem big, just yeah. larger than life. And for me to recreate something like that, I have to change completely how I compose shots. So that involved me going from shooting landscape photos of landscapes to actually shooting in portrait orientation quite a bit again so I can encompass you know the sky a lot in my scenes because I might not necessarily have the advantage of a wide open sweeping vista or some sort of you know great geographic landmark on the ground that I can utilize so that means for me as well that I'm spending a lot of time uh, doing shooting during, you know, the inclement weather season, uh, you know, where you've got really dramatic skies. It's not the easiest state to shoot and it's beautiful. I love it here, yeah. but it's, a, it's definitely a challenge, you know, at the, the opportunities aren't quite as frequent here as I think that they would be in, you know, the desert Southwest or Northern California. Yeah. Well, I, I interviewed a photographer, Wyman Meisner, who's sort of like the official photographer of Texas. Yeah. And he's photographed a lot in the great plains of Texas where, you know, you don't have the, the ground in the mountainous areas that are so like rich, like you have them over here on the West coast. But mm -hmm. uh, like you, like you said, he uses the sky and the clouds. I mean, he loves a good storm. Yes. You yeah. know, and he makes beautiful, beautiful photographs. So, you know, uh, both you and he are, are good examples of people that, you know, can make beautiful landscape photographs without necessarily having the, the, the landlocked, um, subject matter to make really right. interesting photographs. Yeah. One of the challenges that I can imagine though is like the extreme weather, like the, the you know, the humid summers and the, and the bitter, bitter cold winters. Yeah. And, you know, that's reason enough for me to just stay at home. <laughs> but, but I'm sure that, the, you know, there are times when you just have to get out there and shoot under those kind of conditions. Talk to me about, you know, having to contend with that when you, you know, with respect to your photography. I tell people, I actually, I, I think I probably included in posts every once in a while. It's just like a little, little bit of motivating text when I post something online. And, and to me, and that is, uh, in order to create art, you have to sacrifice. I think you have to give a little something, whether it's you're giving your time, whether you're giving your comfort, you know, you have to give a little. So here in Michigan in the wintertime, you're definitely giving up a little bit of comfort, but the rewards are worth it. You know, I spend time on the shore of Lake Michigan during the winter months. Well, a normal winter this winter, it's going to be 70 degrees here in a couple of days, but a typical winter in February, I'd find myself on the shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, specifically, uh, there's a town, Grand Haven, Michigan, that has a wonderful pier with lighthouses on it. And it's subject to 15 to 20 foot waves that break over the lighthouse and it's just intense weather 
and you just need to bundle up and be willing to sacrifice or you know you're going to spend some time out there uh, scraping ice off the front element of your lenses uh, is something <laughs> that uh, that I did the other year I celebrated New Year's Day with a couple of friends under gale force winds and driving snow and we took turns jumping back into the vehicles and scraping the accumulated ice off the front of our cameras but oh, it was um, definitely worth it you know to see waves that are 15 20 foot tall you know crashing over an ice covered pier it's it's a beautiful thing but again you know it's a, a little bit of sacrifice involved how much planning is involved because like you said before you, you got your wife you got kids you know how how much planning is involved in being able to set a, set up time for yourself to go out and, and make your foot on earth uh, when my kids were younger, a lot of a lot of planning was involved with that. But um, as my kids got older, um, my wife has gotten a lot more understanding. You know, she knows that if we're sitting at the dinner table and the room turns pink and yellow because of the sunset, she's pretty much guaranteed that I'm bolting out the door at some point <laughs> with a camera in my hand. You know, so the planning at this stage of my life is just you know, am I willing to make the sacrifice and time to go? My wife is, is beautiful for that. She doesn't care. Uh, my kids know that their dad's nuts and mm -hmm. we'll just take off and go shoot. And it, it works out really well that way, except for there was one instance where I finished up dinner and the TV gave us an alert that there was storms coming. And I told my wife, I said, well, you know what that means? And she says, no, whatever. You're not going to get anything. We never get storms around here. Well, that was the time, of course, that we had tornado come through town and knock oh, down wow. trees. And it was, and of course, I was just on the other side of the storm and missed the worst of it and didn't, I got a couple of good pictures out of it, but I came home to a, a frantic wife and a town that was in disarray. <laughs> so you know, again, sacrifice. Yeah, when I look at your photography, you do a stuff other than sort of landscape and wildlife. Is that was that largely as a result of not necessarily having that that the convenience of that subject matter, but you wanting something to shoot? I think that's definitely part of it. You know, I find myself just taking a walk around the block. I live in a very small town. We have four traffic lights in the whole town. It's a small farming community. There's always something interesting you know like we have empty lots and empty fields you know just outside of my neighborhood so there's always a place for me to walk and if I don't necessarily you know have the time to jump in the car and head a couple of counties over to shoot something I'll find myself with my camera in my hand and just walking through fields or walking through one of the granaries here in town and shooting the silos um, I just I think everything is beautiful in its own way and it's fun to go out and find those little gems you know hidden in everything and just shoot though you know shoot the things that nobody looks at yeah you know that, that is so funny because it's the the appreciation of what's around you photographically is so relative like i i feel like if i were in an environment like that i'd have a field day yeah <laughs> right just because it's just so different from what i experienced and i think my my synapses would be firing simultaneously and it's like if you came out here you probably you know would be wearing yourself out with all the stuff that's there to photograph yeah but i you know it's 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 i think every every photographer's challenge is being able to see their familiar environment in a unique way but i think it's an important challenge to sort of take on like you just said to just go out there and explore and try to see it a little differently yeah I, you know and i think some of it too is that when i first started shooting I had it drilled into my head through so many different things that I saw online, whether it was in articles or YouTube videos or interviews with other people where you were instructed or it was recommended that if you were going to take this serious and you wanted to go anywhere with your photography, you needed to niche down and specialize. You know, I heard that over and over yeah. again. Mm -hmm. And to me, it, it just doesn't work. I, I don't want to be pigeonholed. I, I Like I told you a second ago, I think everything – in life can be beautiful, you know, so why would I, why would I pass up an opportunity to capture something, you know, that's just kind of how I look at it. I, I want to capture as much as I can. Life's way too short to not pull the trigger on a couple of great photos just because it doesn't fit a genre that you shoot most of the time. In the next several weeks, I'll be teaching a couple of courses through the Los Angeles Center of Photography. On Sunday, March 19th, I'll be teaching a short course on mastering the core fundamentals of your camera. 
where I'll teach you not only about the technical side of metering, exposure, white balance, and focus, but provide you context as to when and how to control those things to make consistently great photographs. And then on April 8th, I'll be teaching a full day workshop on street photography. After a short presentation, we'll hit the streets and I'll walk you through my process of seeing and photographing. Whether you're new to street photography or have some experience under your belt, you will find plenty to learn and enjoy as we explore the streets of Los Angeles together. Find out more about these and other great courses offered at the Los Angeles Center of Photography by visiting lacphoto.org. So how did you come to being out there making these photographs and sort of satisfying that creative need and sort of start transitioning into becoming more than just a hobbyist photographer? Well, I think a lot of that, in all honesty, came down to being approached by Olympus. You know, I had reached out to a couple of different brands as I was uh, hosting a photo walk and um, Think Tank Photo said that, you know, that they would participate in my photo walk and give me some stuff to give away. And I am told my contact at Think Tank, you know, I wish I knew someone like you at Olympus, you know, see if I could get them involved. He had connections and one thing led to another and I was being loaned equipment from Olympus. And at that point, I kind of realized that, you know, they were familiar with my work online because they'd seen what I was sharing socially. Mm -hmm. And when I was told, oh, we know who you are, we follow you online, that kind of clicked in my head, you know, that, all right, maybe I shouldn't necessarily share every single thing I shoot. Maybe I should kind of, you know, filter out a little bit of what I'm shooting and, you know, slow down, take a little bit more time and be a little more, um, I don't know, careful about what I'm shooting and just try to up the game a little bit, I guess. So it's, right, uh -huh. I almost feel like, you know, the possibility of taking my photography to the next level, you know, with corporate help might've influenced it a little bit. I don't okay. know. It's, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. So ex explain, to, explain to people who may not be familiar with, you know, with the trailblazer, trailblazer program, <laughs> what, 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 what that involves. Okay, so uh, Olympus has this program called the Visionary Program, and it's broken up into two different types of people who are involved in that program. You've got the visionaries, and those are people like um, Ann Day and Jay Dickman, Larry Price, uh, Tracy McGlosky. These are all people who are really well established in the industry, you know, from Nat Geo photographers to Pulitzer Prize winners. And then you step it down to the next level, which is the, the level that I'm involved in. That's the Trailblazer Program. And those are people who are not necessarily full-time photographers. Some of us are, you know, really active socially. Some of us, um, you know, teach photography workshops, but again, aren't necessarily as established in the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I do. I'm part of that program. And what that involves is it's, it's basically like a dream come true for anybody who's into photography. As far as I'm concerned, I continue to do what I do, which is shoot and share socially. You know, I mentioned like I had been doing all along what gear I'm shooting with. I'll do different speaking engagements for Olympus. You know, I might go to, again, I mentioned earlier, the Out of Chicago conference that takes place in June. Um, I'm one of the speakers there. Or um, Olympus might have an event at a camera store somewhere around the country, and they'll bring me in to present there and lead photo walks. And in exchange for that, I get, you know, access to equipment. Lots of times I get access to equipment before it's publicly available or even sometimes known to the public. And I get exposure through them. So it's a, it's a really great trade off. You know, I get to shoot and share and do everything that I've been doing all along. And I'm supported by them in the process. Yeah. And it probably, it sort of can serve as the impetus to go out there and make, go out and make new photographs. Cause I know when I, when I was writing regularly, regularly for uh, magazines, uh, ha having a new camera come in was just like, okay, let me get out. <laughs> you know, if I had a new lens, oh, I got to play with that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have a quota that I have to meet, you know, and it's it's such a low bar. I have, you know, like uh, five images a month I need to to produce for them, which is not a problem at all. But like you said, when a new piece of equipment comes along, uh, a new lens or a new camera body, it's definitely a motivator to go shoot. I think my Twitter tagline or motto or whatever you want to call it that you can post on Twitter. Um, I think I mentioned that uh, new gear won't make you shoot better, but it can inspire you to shoot better. And by that, I just mean that, you know, 
you get a new piece of equipment, you're motivated to go out and push it to its limits and, you know, push yourself to your limits photographically to see what you can do with it. Yeah. You know, having a relationship with a manufacturer can be kind of tricky, especially when people are looking to you because they want your feedback. Mm-hmm, there, there's some people who kind of question whether or not you're going to be completely honest. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, you have this arrangement. So how do you sort of contend with that when, when people press you on it? That's tough. You know, I, I've only had people mention that maybe once or twice in all honesty. You know, I produce a, a decent amount of YouTube videos and I'll review products as they come out. You know, I do the unboxing thing when I get access to it early enough, you know, or I'll do follow up videos talking about, you know, my experience with it. I try to let people know, you know, that I'm being genuine. Um, you know, every, no, I shouldn't say everybody knows, but most of the people that are subscribing to me know, or I make a disclaimer, you know, that, you know, what my standing with Olympus is, what my position with them is. But I think people, I think I have a connection that's good enough with people who follow me online that they know kind of who I am as a person. I know Mm -hmm. it sounds kind of cheesy to think that you could know somebody just from from their videos online and and things like that. But I I try to stay as genuine as possible. And if you watch the podcast that I do with Mike Baining, you can see that, you know, the same person that's doing that podcast is the same person that is doing the YouTube videos and is the same person that's making his posts on Facebook. I'm I'm the real deal. I don't <laughs> I don't put on a certain persona for anything, you know. S- sometimes it works. Sometimes I'm a little too laid back and relaxed, you know, and it <laughs> might not seem the most professional, I suppose, but you know, I just I want to be me and that's who I'm selling to everybody is just me. Well, that's why that's what I enjoy about what you and Michael do. Thank is you. Is that you guys are genuine because I've uh, you know, they, in, I've been around doing podcasts for 11 years now, so I've I've seen a lot of people come and go, and there's some people out there who are probably still around. Who I just feel like I wouldn't want to spend any personal time with this person, you know, right? Just because I <laughs> yeah. feel like they have an agenda, right? And then there are other people, you know, and I include you and uh, Michael in there, who I just feel like are really genuine and are being really uh, honest, and that's something I appreciate because it's, you know, especially in the photo industry, there's enough, st- you know, enough content out there with people just trying to sell you something. Right. And it's, you know, I really sort of appreciate people just sharing their experience. And then I can sort of decide, you know, whether or not I, 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 I can value that or whether I just kind of like want to move on to the next thing. I appreciate that. You know, it's it's kind of what we do. You know, it's funny. We have this little running joke between us that we're kind of the Wayne's world of the photography <laughs> podcast. We're, we're, we're considering doing a show sitting on a couch, you know, and uh, it's funny. We're definitely probably going to do that at some point. But, but you know, one of the things that sort of probably you couldn't have ex- expected is the fact that you're an educator now. You know, you're, oh, you're teaching yeah. other people. So tell me about that, because, you know, especially if, it's one thing to, to be a self-trained photographer. It's another thing to be kind of a, a self-trained teacher. Yeah. You know, that's something that I never saw coming. And if if you would have asked me even, you know, three years ago when I, or four years ago when I first started doing this with Olympus, if I saw myself teaching people, I don't think I would have ever told you, yeah, sure. That's exactly what my plans and my goals and aspirations are to be and do. But um, but here I am, you know, teaching it out of Chicago and Mike and I do workshops together. I love it, you know, and I think that because I'm pretty, I I think I'm easy to get along with. I mean, I think people like me and I just kind of try to keep everything like the show, you know, everything's laid back. It's low key. I try to keep everything personal when I'm teaching. And I know I've actually been told that I was exactly what they thought I would be like in person as I was on the show. I've actually been told that a couple of times. So I was like, that's great. So I'm definitely doing what I want to be doing, but teaching is, it's a beautiful thing. It's it's incredible. Um, do you mind if I tell you a short story about one yeah. of the workshops? That yeah, Mike please, please do. So last summer, Mike and I were doing a workshop in Philadelphia, and uh, there was a woman on the workshop, Robin, wonderful woman. She was incredible. It was so exciting to meet her because she was excited to meet me, so I was super excited to meet her. And she wanted me to teach her how to use the live composite function on the Olympus cameras and for people who don't know what that is, you could Google it or it just allows you to do really interesting long exposures in camera. 
So we were supposed to go to Boathouse Row in Philadelphia, and it's this spot on a river whose name I cannot pronounce. And there are these beautiful houses on it that are all lit up with lights. Well, this was right before the Democratic National Convention last year, and somebody had decided to remove all of the LED or all of the lights off of these homes and replace them with LEDs. So our initial plan of shooting this Boathouse Row at night doing long exposures and and beautiful reflections were squashed. You know, Mm. there were no lights on the homes. So we thought maybe we can get a sunset on the river and then shoot some, some skyline at night. And as we're walking to our spot, there was a bright flash of light and a rumble of thunder. And I said, Oh my gosh, this would be so incredible if we could get some lightning shots with the city skyline. And just like on cue, the storm moved behind the skyline of the city and started just displaying massive lightning bolts. So I got to to teach Robin how to properly set up the live composite function on her uh, Olympus OMD. And she was almost in tears with how incredible her photo turned out. It was the Philadelphia skyline with about a dozen lightning bolts streaking down behind all the buildings. And she told me that the whole workshop was worth that 10 minute of working with me and getting mm-hmm. that one photo. And I'll tell you what, ever since then, I thought I, I think I just want to continue to do the, the workshops and the teaching because it was such a powerful moment for me. Yeah, man. There's nothing more gratifying than having, helping someone have that sort of revelatory moment. Yeah. When they've discovered what they're capable of doing. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. it was pretty powerful for both of us. <laughs> That's real satisfying. So how, how did it come to be that you, you guys decided to do uh, uh, the podcast? So I had done, well, I've always been a fan of podcasts. I'll just get that out of the way first. You know, I started off listening to Leo Laporte a long time ago and all the the tech stuff and then transitioned over to This Week in Photo. And so I've I've always loved listening to podcasts. I've always had a day job that involved a 30 or 40 minute car ride each way. So I had an hour a day to kill listening to stuff. So podcasting from years ago. And I started doing YouTube videos, um, just little quick tips, or at least I tried to, you know, they were, they were pretty bad in the beginning. Um, and I called them mirror, a mirrorless minute. It was supposed to be a one minute long video on getting the most out of your Olympus mirrorless camera. And I realized I don't think anybody was doing a podcast on mirrorless cameras at the time. You know, I told myself I should do something a little bit bigger than just me standing in front of the camera. And I had never met Mike and had only saw his posts on Facebook and heard a few people mention how there's this other guy in Michigan who's a huge Olympus user and, you know, knows his stuff. So I reached out to Mike and said, hey, you want to do a podcast with me? Mm. <laughs> and it was literally just like that. I, I didn't even know the guy. And so we met up at a Panera Bread for breakfast one day <laughs> and talked about it. And so over breakfast at Panera, Mirrorless Minutes was born. Hey, man, two years with a, with a, with a, as a co-host with someone is, is no small feat. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, he's, he's really easy to get along with. Uh, we travel together. We've shared a hotel room together, uh, you know, so he's – He's like me. He's a, a Midwest guy. Really easy to get along with. Yeah. So for people who may not have have seen or heard uh, heard the podcast, tell us tell us a little about uh, what your, your what your approach is. Yeah, sure. So it's uh, like I said, it's it's really laid back. You know, we consider ourselves like the Wayne's World of podcasts. It's just the two of us talking back and forth. The format has a little bit of structure. We've got some things that we always try to do, which is, you know, share some of the photos that we've shot in between the last show. Um, We do a show every two weeks on a Wednesday night. Um, So we'll share what we shot over the last two weeks. We'll talk about any kind of news, you know, and photography. As far as like Olympus products, we tend to focus a lot on that, regardless of the fact we're called mirrorless minutes. We mm-hmm. we are primarily Olympus, although we do have users from other systems on the show f- from time to time. But it's basically just the two of us talking back and forth. You know, we like to talk about uh, events that are coming up that we're doing, or again, like product news and just share some of the images that we shot. It's really just a couple of guys Chewing the fat. Yeah, one of my favorite parts is when you guys talk about the images that you've created. Yeah. But I, 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 every time I watch that, I go, man, that is a little bit of pressure, you know, to go, <laughs> okay, I got to shoot before the next episode so I can have right. something to talk about. 
Yeah, it, you know, and it's funny because it's the pressure is twice as bad for me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make it known that Mike has it pretty easy in that regard. So Mike, both and I, Mike and I have day jobs. You know, we're career people. Mm-hmm. Mike's career is one that has him traveling all around the country regularly. I mean, on any any given week, he's from California to I don't know New Jersey to Texas to Arizona. You name it, he's all over the place. So he's always got. <laughs> the opportunity to shoot somewhere new and i'm still in this little farm town here in michigan having to uh walk around the block sometimes or uh hike in the woods to get my shots but you know it's it's definitely fun it's definitely fun but you know what i, I kind of admire about what you're doing is that you know you have your day job you have your family you have a daily commute but you are really consistent in terms of everything you produce from your photographs to your podcast to your workshops you know uh, th- there are a lot of people who have faced similar circumstances that you know, all they, all they succeed is in producing excuses for not doing <laughs> a lot of the things that they want. And you are, you are very consistent. I know it can be really difficult to do, but, uh, that's what I really appreciate uh, about what you do. So how, how do you succeed at being able to do this where other people don't? You know, we just really love what we're doing. You know, we, we have this really tight knit, close community. If you look at, the mirrorless minutes facebook page and then go to the mirrorless minutes youtube channel i think you'll find that the the page likes and the subscriber count match up almost number to number they're pretty close mm-hmm. so it's a really extremely tight knit community that we interact with on a on a pretty regular basis you know um we're quick to respond we get a lot of questions from people asking us you know well, how do i do this with my camera or how did you do that or what do you recommend for this or whatever and we respond really really quick and i think that mike and i both feel this certain sense of obligation to um to the people that watch the show you know i i know that i missed one show and i mentioned before you and i started talking on the show here that uh the one show i did miss my wife had fallen while we were hiking and broke her hip in the middle of nowhere. That was the one time I missed a show and people were really concerned wondering why the show didn't go on because it was literally the day we were supposed to go on the air. Mm -hmm. When you have people reaching out saying, what's going on? You know, something must be wrong. We, we noticed you guys didn't go on last night. You know that you're connecting with people in a way that probably a lot of other shows don't necessarily. Yeah. So I I know that I personally and I know Mike does too. We we both feel this level of commitment to to the people that subscribe. Well, th- let's talk about the uh, the Chicago workshop because I guess you guys have been doing it. This is going to be the third year. Yeah, this is the third year for out of Chicago, and. That's an incredible workshop. I'm definitely going to plug those guys right now. It's <laughs> it's it's uh the Out of Chicago conference. It's not like any other photography event that I'm aware of because I think a lot of other photography events are like trade shows, you know. It's where mm-hmm. you go to see gear. You know, it's not really necessarily 100% about the education experience or the social experience for that matter. Whereas out of Chicago, you're not in an environment where the instructors are up on a stage or standing in a show booth presenting to you and then they're done and then you walk away. And out of Chicago, you have one-on-one access to, you know, a multitude of different people from different uh, photography genres. Um, and you can just really get right up and talk one-on-one with people. Uh, I've met numerous friends from all around the country. We've had people that come to our workshops that, you know, again, we're out of Chicago attendees. It's, it's a wonderful conference. I think, again, I don't think it's like anything else that's out there. It runs for uh, a couple of days. There are some pre uh, pre-conference workshops that happen, I think Thursday and Friday. And then the, the actual meat of the program starts, you know, uh, Friday night and then runs Saturday and Sunday. And how about the workshops that you and Mike run? So the workshops that Mike and I run, they vary quite a bit. So um, our first workshops that we did, we called them small town to downtown. And it was cool because Mike and I got to, we got to shoot to, we got to cater to two different types of crowds and shoot to what we enjoyed ourselves. So the small town portion of it was my side of it. And we did some rural shooting here in Michigan and the downtown portion of it was downtown Detroit, you know, a lot of street shooting and uh, urban architecture. 
the Philadelphia workshop, uh, we couldn't do the same format because we weren't familiar with the outskirts of, of Philadelphia well enough to be able to do the small town portion of it. So mm -hmm. we basically just make the workshops all about, you know, the urban environment at that point, just like our Chicago workshop that we're going to do this fall. We're going to do one aside from out of Chicago. We're going to come back in the fall and do a uh, an urban workshop there. That, that's I think that's fascinating being able to explore both the, the the small town and the big city stuff simultaneously. Yeah, it's it's easy to do here in Michigan, you yeah. know, especially you know the fact that we're both from here, we both know where to go to experience, you know, the two different worlds. I guess you know you could call them. Um, and I know we're considering doing the same format again here. It'd be later on in the year, but it would be on the west side of the state this time. Well, with all the stuff that you've done, you know, with the communities that you've built through the, you know, through the workshops, through your relationship with, with Olympus and all this stuff, you know, what, what do you attribute to making you sort of a better photographer? Because, you know, we always talk about going out and just shoot and shoot and shoot and that will make you better. But besides just, you know, being persistent and consistent in terms of making photographs of all the things that you do, what do you sort of attribute most to you being, becoming a better, better photographer? You know, I don't necessarily buy into the shoot, 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 and you'll get better. I think photography for some people can be like golf. I know people who've golfed their whole lives and they suck, yeah. you know, so I don't necessarily, I don't want to tell people shoot a million photos. It's going to make you better. I just want to tell people, you know, that what worked for me was to just to shoot what felt good, like what, what you think looks good and actually has a place emotionally connected to you. So, and that's why you'll see a lot of my photos too. They're not necessarily representative of exactly what the scene looked like there. What my finished product is, is what the scene represented to me when I was there. I consider most of my photos, the vast majority of them, the photo that comes out of the camera, that's my canvas. And then I love to work in post. I'm not afraid to get in there and digitally paint up my picture i'm not one of those purist straight out of camera mm -hmm. people you know uh, and maybe that goes back to you know high school and working with watercolors where you know you don't necessarily have a hundred percent full-blown control over you know what goes down on the paper you know it just kind of the the painting materializes for you just, you just kind of flow with it and that's kind of how i see some of the landscapes i shoot you know i just get back home and just think about how did I feel when I was shooting that, you know, and that's again, probably why a lot of my skies are really wildly dramatic or the, the composition might be composed so that it's really dramatic. It's not, you know, uh, necessarily rule of thirds, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So I think that just shooting what you feel is the, is the way to go. That's great. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is that I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? So this question, I was so worried when it was going to come up because I'm not like traditionally trained in photography. Um, if you asked me to name a classic photographer, I probably could pull out like five, you know, if I was lucky, if it was a good day and, and my brain was working properly. But growing up in photography in the digital world, you know, I spent most of my digital life on Flickr and found a gentleman named Rodney Harvey on Flickr. And I really connect with the work that he makes on there. A lot of his work is shot, I think, in the Plain States, if I'm not mistaken. I think uh, Missouri, maybe. And he shoots a lot of old structures that are in wide open vistas, you know, again, places that I don't necessarily have access here into Michigan. So I think that maybe that's why they connect with me. But his black and white work of these beautiful old farmhouses and old school houses in the Plain States are just incredible. Oh, I look forward to checking out his work. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. I really enjoyed having the chance to talk with you in person finally. Uh, it was great to be on. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thanks for listening and thanks to Jamie for joining us on The Candid Frame. You can check out his photography by visiting jmcdonaldphoto.com and subscribe to his podcast by visiting mirrorlessminutes.com. Thank you for your continued support of The Candid Frame. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Your ratings and comments help people to discover the great conversations like the one you heard today. 
You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and the candid frame website. Or if you just want to make a one time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal by clicking on the donate button on the candid frame website or again in the show notes. Thanks to all of you who have recently contributed to the show, including Jan Jacob Tripp and James Meher. We so appreciate it. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbarianX. Remember to help spread the word. And this is IbarianX, and this is The Candid Frame.